Hi everyone and welcome to session two, Resilience in Primary Care with Simon Matthews. So for those that are joining um, into the primary care stream now, uh, my name is Claire Dagley and I'm the Regional Senior Manager for the Barwon Southwest Region at West Vic PHN and I'll be facilitating the second session today. So we'd like to say thank you to Geelong Hospice for sponsoring this session and please remember when you have time to pop over to the sponsors lounge and browse through the individual pages. We couldn't run these events without the support of our generous sponsors. Please also take the time to have a, take note sorry, of the health pathway for this session, uh, which isn't on the screen now, but you should be able to access that um, and there'll be, as there will be information about this in the handout section. If you do have a question for Simon, please type it into the live Q&A box and I will ask as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Any general comments can be entered into the discussion forum section. I would now like to introduce Simon Matthews, who we've got dialing in virtually uh, with us today. So Simon is a psychologist and fellow of the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. He's a board certified, oh sorry, he's board certified in health coaching and lifestyle medicine. He is the CEO of Wellness Coaches Australia and Wellness Coaches Singapore, and is an adjunct lecturer at Avondale University Lifestyle Medicine and Health Research Centre. In addition, Simon is a director of the US not-for-profit Global Positive Health Institute and a director of the Australian not-for-profit Practice Excellence Institute. He is also a member of the International Advisory Board for the Romanian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. Simon consults internationally in the areas of health coaching, behaviour change, positive psychology and lifestyle medicine. When not working, he also loves talking about his other passions, such as film and, sorry, talking about his other passion as a film and TV extra, a gardener and a self-taught cook. So now I'd like to hand over to Simon Matthews. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, just a very, very small correction. Um, I'm actually the CEO of Well Coaches Australia, not, not Wellness Coaching Australia. Well Coaches Australia and Well Coaches Singapore. Um, but, uh, but thank you, nevertheless, Claire. I, I appreciate that. Great to be here. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you all. So... We've got uh, we've got the next hour together, and uh, I'm going to speak to you about um, what we're going, to, we're going to speak a little bit about resilience. But there's some other things that I want to uh, I want to bring in here as well. Some things that are particularly pertinent right now. Uh, please do feel free to uh, to ask questions. I'd love to uh, to get into some dialogue with uh, with some of you around some of these uh, some of these ideas. Um, there are no, of course, uh, silly questions here. Um, and uh, if you're asking a question, you're guaranteed, of course, to, uh, to uh, be asking it on behalf of a number of people <laughs> who are also uh, probably wondering that same thing. Um, but I would like to take just a moment uh, before, we, before we get going to, to uh, I'm sure you've done this already, but, uh, but make my own acknowledgement of the, uh, the lands on which we all are. I'm in Darkinjung country on the central coast of New South Wales, uh, about an hour north of Sydney, uh, near Gosford, for those of you who might know. Uh, and, uh, and I invite you, of course, to, uh, to continue to, uh, to reflect yourselves on the, the land on which you stand. Um, what I want to give you by the end of this session is, uh, is some clear ideas about, uh, about burnout in particular. Uh, I want you to walk away with, uh, with a clear understanding of what that is. I want you to walk away with some clear ideas about how you can recognise it uh, and also some clear ideas about what you can do about it, both in yourselves and, and other people. The good news is that... Uh, that there, there are things that we can do and things that do make a difference. Um, people, people come back from burnout. It's not a, it's not a permanent uh, lifelong impairment. It's certainly devastating uh, to be in the midst of it, but, uh, but it doesn't have to be lifelong. So I really, I really want to embed that, that message right now that, that, that there are things you can do uh, that will make a difference for you and your colleagues and friends. That said, 
let's uh, let's dive uh, let's dive right in. So a quick um, you know the, the times in which we're living, of course, are, are new for most of us. Um, I mean, times are always new, but there are some particular things about this time that are uh, quite remarkable for most of us alive. The, the last time that we had a pandemic on this scale was, of course, 1918, the influenza pandemic. Uh, there have been other things in between that have been declared pandemics by the World Health Organization. For example, HIV is a pandemic, Ebola is a pandemic, but it doesn't seem, certainly in this part of the world, I mean, it wasn't, wasn't, that neither of those things affected us in, in the same way. So we're, we're living this, most of us, uh, probably all of us actually, for the, first, uh, for the first time. There's some pretty unique things about this time and um, we've got already got some research coming through about the impact of the pandemic on the mental health and well-being of various workforces. We, we've been fortunate here to, generally speaking, have relatively low levels of COVID-19 infection compared with the rest of the world. Um, despite that, we have um, some very reliable reports already that healthcare professionals are generally reporting moderate to high levels of uh, burnout. There's a, a reference there that, that paper was published last year in Australian Psychiatry. Um, and for those healthcare professionals working in emergency departments and intensive care units, um, that increased to high. Uh, so a high rate of burnout for those people. Um, and that, that particular paper was also published last year in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. Um, healthcare professionals, of course, are not alone in this. We're seeing similar rates of burnout amongst uh, emergency services professionals, uh, police, paramedics, firefighters, and so on. Uh, but certainly uh, the, um, the pandemic has been devastating on the healthcare workforce with respect to burnout. So one of the questions I want to ask right now um, in relation to that um, is uh, who's actually surprised? Uh, and um, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm guessing that no one is putting their hand up. Um, we're, we're not actually surprised about that. Uh, if you think about all the factors and circumstances that have led uh, led to that situation, it really is no surprise that, that it's had such a devastating impact on our, uh, on our healthcare workforce. But here's the thing, and I want to establish this as a baseline straight away, because it's very, very important. If you are reading this right now, and if you're here participating in this right now, then you are resilient. Um, by definition, if you are still here, after two and a half years, you are resilient. And I really, really want that message to, uh, to, to come through very strongly. And I, and I, I really encourage you to, uh, to grab a hold of that idea and, um, and hang on to it. Uh, the, the, fact that, um, the fact that you're here means you are doing and have been doing things that have been bolstering that for you and supporting you to keep putting one foot in front of the other during very trying and difficult and unknown times. So I really want to encourage you, um, perhaps now, perhaps some things are coming to mind for you straight away, but certainly after this session as well, I want to encourage you to reflect on what are those things that you're doing? What are those things that you're doing that are enabling you to, uh, to keep moving forward despite the really uh, challenging times that, um, that we're facing? What are you already doing uh, that's supporting you to keep moving forward? What are you already doing that's allowing you to tolerate ambiguity and uncertainty? We're going to talk more about those later. Um, these are the new resilience, ambiguity, or, or tolerating ambiguity and uncertainty, and I'll say some more about that later. And what are you already doing that's driving you to continue to support and contribute to your colleagues, patients, your family, your friends, and so on? If you're still here, if you're still participating, then you are doing some of these things already. I really want to encourage you to, uh, to reflect on those. I want to spend a bit of time focused on burnout and understanding burnout. There are still mis some misperceptions about burnout, and that's partly because we didn't really have a clear definition until relatively recently. Uh, when I was a psychologist in the mid-1990s, we talked about burnout, we, we recognised some signs of it. We also tended towards a view, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, that that burnout represented perhaps some 
uh, some uh, some lack in in the individual concerned. People were experiencing burnout because they you know didn't didn't have what it takes to deal with the stresses of life. There was still a little bit of that. Well, there was still that view prevailing. Thankfully, that view has diminished, and it was only just prior to the the pandemic in 2019 that the World Health Organization uh, introduced a, a definition of burnout, which we're going to look at shortly. So for the next few minutes, this is, uh, this is where we're going to head, um, understanding what burnout is, understanding what to look for, how you can recognize it, what you can do, what you can do next, thinking about the role that resilience might play. And I've already hinted that we might start to think differently about resilience and then and then answering that question where do i buy it where, where can i get resilience the answer is um, you don't buy it anywhere you 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 already have the, the tools to build it and develop it and i want to encourage you to continue doing that so let's start here what's burnout so the world health organization uh, definition this is in the uh, the icd 11 uh, um, uh, just a couple of years ago syndrome conceptualized as resulting from here's the key chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. It's a workplace injury in effect. Uh, it's a condition that arises from workplaces. Uh, and it's characterized by three dimensions that you can see there. The first one is exhaustion, just feeling absolutely and utterly exhausted. This is different from the fatigue that we all get from time to time. Different, different from that feeling that we have uh, on Friday afternoons when we say, oh my goodness, I want the weekend to start. Different from that feeling um, that I've got right now because I'm going on leave for a month next week. Different from that feeling that says, I cannot wait for next week to, uh, to come around. This is a, this is a, a bone shattering exhaustion that feeling of barely being able to put one foot in front of the other. The second element is an increasing mental distance from your work, a, a, a disconnection, if you like, from, from work, a, a feeling like it, it just it, it doesn't, doesn't hold the same interest, doesn't hold the same passion, value. Um, you, you don't desire it as much as you used to. You're starting to feel more distant from it, more disconnected from it. And the third element of burnout is a reduction in your productivity and efficiency. Um, in other words, your efficacy. Um, not, not being as productive as you usually might be. Uh, not, not, not producing the work uh, as well as you might usually produce it. So there's three elements need to be there for, for us to be able to say someone is experiencing burnout. You might be looking at those right now and thinking, oh, actually, kind of is describing me. Um, well, that's kind of describing someone I know. Um, so uh, we're, going to, we're going to keep going and, and look a little more specifically at, um, at what might be going on, uh, the things that you might be able to see that will support you to understand uh, more about this. Just a reminder, burnout refers specifically to occupational contexts. It doesn't refer, for example, to, uh, to personal, um, personal life or any other area of your life, really. Uh, it's it's all about uh, all about work. Of course, it does um, it does have impacts in other areas of your life, but its origin uh, is from work. So there are six factors generally that can contribute to burnout, and generally speaking, it's a it's a high frequency or a high volume of stressors. Uh, in these six areas. So we talked about it being that idea of unmanaged stressors. So the first is workload, simply the amount or the volume of work to be done. It's been a particular challenge through the pandemic because we know with uh, large numbers of people absent on sick leave, um, uh, particularly in healthcare and increasing numbers of people sick, we, we've had that double whammy of needing to do more work and having had fewer people available to do it. So workload itself has been a tremendous pressure uh, during this time. Uh, another factor is autonomy, the, the sense of choice and control that you have over the work you do. Uh, and the, the key here is thinking about um, the extent to which you're able to make some decisions yourself about your work within a set of parameters or guidelines. So here's the, here's the broad parameters in which you must conduct your work and you're free to move like this to, to work as you see fit. Or do you, do you work actually in an environment where your autonomy is really minimized, where you simply um, must do this thing at this time 
uh, every single time. So that's another, uh, another stressor. Um, uh, the third is uh, rewards, so recognition for the work that you do. This is outside of salary, outside of payment. Um, we all get paid for our work, um, but, but how much is your work recognised? How much does someone take the time to say, thanks, I really appreciate that. Um, what, what you did there really, really made a big difference to me. Um, thanks. Uh, how often does that happen in your workplace? Um, community, our sense of connection to colleagues, our sense of connection to manager, supervisor, even the patients that we work with. H how much do we feel like um, we're, we're part of a, a network of relationships here? Fairness, the sense of being treated with respect, the sense of being treated with equity, same as other people. Um, looking around and feeling like what, what goes on here is fair to everyone. And importantly, for burnout to occur, the unfairness doesn't necessarily need to apply to you. Um, watching unfairness unfold and negatively impact other people can also ultimately have a negative impact on you. And then the final element is um, values, personal values, and the extent to which um, they're a good match for the organisation in which you work. The, the sense in which your organisation, your workplace, allows you to live out those values that, that really, really matter to you, whatever they are, uh, whether they're values of kindness or, or caring for other people or making a difference in the world or whatever it might be. Um, if your organisation um, potentiates those, then you're likely to have a good experience. If your organisation or culture is one in which it's difficult for you to express those values, then that's one of the things that can lead to that uh, over time, that, that grinding mismatch that can ultimately result in, uh, in burnout. So the other six factors, there are some things, of course, that can exacerbate those and make them worse or, or indeed can make them better. So, so one of those is unrealistic, unrealistic expectations. Workload is one thing, uh, but a, 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 an organisation or a workplace in which the workload is high and we recognise and talk about the limited amount we can all do is different from a workplace in which the workload is high and there's still an expectation that we must get through everything. Micromanagement, that sense of having hover, someone hovering over you, um, directing every step of what you do. Poor or absent support uh, can uh, exacerbate burnout. And conversely, um, really good support can mitigate the effects of burnout as well. Feeling like you're really supported by someone. Isolation is a significant factor. And this can be either structural. So for example, you might, uh, you might simply work in a, in a location where you are the only person there. Um, that, that might be by design, but isolation can also be psychological. Um, the people can be frozen out as it were, or isolated, even though there might be a lot of bodies in that workplace, there might be a lot of people present, people can still have an experience of being isolated in their work. The fifth factor which can uh, exacerbate it is poor or unclear direction about, uh, about your work and your work tasks. All of those things can work both ways, of course, um, allowing people to find their own way, the opposite of micromanagement um, with support can be beneficial. Um, having realistic expectations, even in the presence of those stressors, can help mitigate. Um, having some, some clear direction, clear instructions, so people understand what they should be doing, makes a difference to our experience of burnout. So they're the, things, they're the things that can lead to it. What might it look like though? What might it look like in you and what might it look like in someone else? So a caveat here, I'm gonna introduce some, uh, some signs and symptoms uh, and uh, there's always the temptation um, when you see something like this to look at something and say, oh, that's me. Um, uh, and uh, most of us would experience at least some of these things I'm gonna show you at some time of course. Uh, the, the key here is to understand that burnout arises when we have um, a, a combination of a number of factors from all of these areas present for a prolonged period of time. Um, kind of similar to, you know, the way we might think about a heart attack. Anyone ever had a pain in the chest? Yeah, I have. Ever had a pain in the neck? Yep. Pain in the arm? Sure. Um, ever felt a bit tight across the chest? Yep. Ever felt nauseated? Yep. Sweaty and shaky? Yep, absolutely. Um, have I felt them all together at the one time? No. 
Uh, so all of them individually um, can mean a certain thing, but it's when they're all together that they point to a particular, uh, particular diagnosis. So signs of exhaustion, first of all, um, just looking and feeling tired. Uh, and you might, this might be your experience, it might be an experience of someone that you know. Frequent headaches, often tension headaches, you know, those headaches that, that feel like someone's put a hose clamp around the, around the top of your head and they're just tightening it down uh, all the time. Um, gastrointestinal upset can be an indicator of this exhaustion. Um, so can um, sleep disturbances, and that might be difficulty going off to sleep uh, because your mind's racing, or it might be that you get off to sleep okay, and then you wake in the middle of the morning, uh, you know, 3 a.m., and your mind's just churning uh, with all these things about work. Uh, chest tightness, shortness of breath, that, that feeling like you can't get your breath, even though you can, um, uh, that can be an indicator of this sort of fatigue, and increased substance use. And worth a reminder here that the two most commonly used substances in Australia, alcohol and caffeine. Um, one's a depressant drug, one's a stimulant drug. Uh, and it's fairly easy uh, for people to get caught in a cycle of using these in an effort to manage fatigue uh, and long-term fatigue. If you're waking up every morning feeling sluggish, what's a great way to get going? Have a coffee. Does it work? Absolutely it does. That's a stimulant drug. Um, put, puts you much closer to the top of your game. Gives you, gives you a bit of a buzz and a bit of a lift. Uh, how long for? Well, caffeine's interesting. It has a half-life in most people of about six hours. So, uh, so half the caffeine is out of your body six hours later. Uh, but we, we start to psychologically notice that the, the effects diminish after maybe 90 minutes. So what do we do? We top up. We have another one to, uh, to give us a, that other boost. Now, now that's got a half-life of about six hours. So our bodies are processing caffeine much more slowly than we're taking it in. By the end of the day, if you've done that two, three or four times, you're likely to feel a little bit uh, wired. It's a great way to wind down at the end of the day. Pour a wine. Um, the smart money would, uh, of course, pour a wine, recognise that uh, you've got about an hour there while your body metabolises that one standard drink to do some other things, some breathing, some relaxation, some meditation, go for a walk, walk the dog, uh, take a bath, anything. Um, unfortunately, we don't tend to do that. We pour a second one and a third one and so on. So it's fairly easy for people to get caught in this uh, cycle of caffeine and alcohol in an effort to manage uh, fatigue. Uh, you might also see these indicators of negativity or cynicism in people. This relates to that, that sense of disconnection from work. People more likely to be irritable, more likely to be sensitive or overly sensitive. Suspicious, suspicious of the motives of people around them. Why did they do that? Why did they say that? Why do they want me to do that? Um, they can get really rigid in their thinking. Things must be done this way. Um, I, I just can't accommodate having to do something differently or do something new. I just don't have the mental space to process that anymore. So we must do it this way. A generally negative attitude, um, a big one in healthcare professionals, compassion fatigue. Think about the stories of the people that you deal with every single day. Um, think about not, not the wound that you might be, um, that you might be dressing uh, or the condition that you might be treating, but the story of the person who has that wound or that condition. And that's what leads to the compassion fatigue. And ultimately, we see people just become detached and disinvested from, uh, from their workplace. Just, just doesn't matter anymore. Um, I just don't care about it that much. Uh, can become the feeling that people have. So that's the second area, signs of cynicism. Yes, we've all had those at different times uh, in relation to different works um, so, or different uh, positions of employment. So uh, again, I want to remind you that, that a single one of these um, doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's the combination of a number of these with a number of those signs from fatigue and also a number of these other signs uh, in the area of productivity and performance uh, that might lead us to think that someone's starting to struggle with burnout. Now. So that can be things um, like making errors in your work, leaving things out of your work, um, feeling useless and, and feeling unaccomplished, it's feeling like you're not doing anything that's really that great, um, increasing absenteeism from work, 
which can be can be whole days off. It can be can be burning through sick leave and family leave, but it can also be things like starting to come in late and making excuses to leave early. I've got an appointment to go to. I've got to go and do this. I've got to dash off early and so on. Missing deadlines for work, um, not not finishing work or, or generally work of a, a poorer quality than might usually be the case. And just being unable to get a sense that you're really making any progress here. Um, feeling like you're marking time. So three areas, exhaustion, cynicism, productivity. Um, and they, they all have some particular signs and indicators. I really want to encourage you to, to become familiar with these. these. These are like, you know, for people who go off and do first aid training, these, these are like those indicators of, um, of cardiovascular events or strokes or, or, um, or you know, snake bite or spider bite or, 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 or toxicity and being poisoned by something. We look for those telltale signs and symptoms that say that this looks like it might be pointing in this direction. Um, so we can do the same thing with burnout. Look, look for these things. Be aware of them in yourself and certainly um, be aware of them in your colleagues and friends and people that you know. There's an additional set of uh, indicators that I want to introduce you to, which are called masked signs. And they're masked because they can actually look like the opposite that they look like maybe things are going really well, but in fact, they're not. And we often see masked signs in people who are high achievers. Why? Because they have a lot invested in, in looking like they're on top of everything and, and looking like they're still managing everything well. And they're these things here, people who have this kind of soldier on um, attitude or they, they have a soldier on expression on their face. They, they force a smile. And we can all tell the difference between a, a natural smile and, and a forced smile. Uh, they tend, rather than displaying absenteeism, they tend to display presenteeism. People who are high achievers tend to stay back late to get the work done. They come in early to get the work done. But when their productivity and their efficacy is declining all the time, they tend not to. They spend more time, but they just don't get the work done. They tend to deny that there's a problem. No, no, everything's okay. That's fine. No, 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 I'll, I'll get up. Don't worry about it. I'm, I'm all good. Um, they, they blow you off. Um, they can be bristly and oversensitive sometimes. And sometimes they can personalise things as well. So comments that might be intended for a broad audience, um, uh, someone might take on board as relating directly to me and, and feeling like they're being singled out for, uh, for this sort of comment. So there's some extra things to be aware of as well and, and be aware that, that some of these things can look like, wow, look at this person, you know, midst of a pandemic, they're coming in, coming in early, they're going home late, they're getting the work done, they're soldiering on, they've got a smile on their face. What a great person they are. And, and, and we think that this is a good thing, um, but there's a danger lurking beneath that that we need to be aware of. So what can you do if you, uh, if you become aware of those things? We, we understand what burnout is and where it comes from. We understand what it can look like in ourselves and other people. What can you do about it? Well, um, I want to encourage you, first of all, to reflect, um, to, to, to notice what you notice and pause, step back. Reflect, think about it. What am I seeing here? Um, think about um, what might the source of this be? You think about the experiences that you've had. What might the factors be that are leading to this? What might be going on in your workplace, particularly, quite apart from what might be going on in the person's life? What might be going on in your workplace that could be contributing to this? So really take some time to reflect and, and uh, recognise what might be there. And then I want to encourage you to take a time to, uh, to reflect on what you're already doing to manage this. This is important. It's really important to recognise the things that we're already doing that are making a difference. A bit like that uh, question I posed to you at the start of this session. What are, you, what are you doing that's allowing you to still be here? Then think about what you could do. Um, what are the other things that you could do? And I want to put a particular challenge here in this last box on the bottom right. And that's what must you do? And the idea I want to evoke here is the idea that when we see someone struggling, we've got a moral obligation, all of us, every human being has a moral obligation to do something. 
uh, it's the same uh, as uh, re regardless, regardless of whether you're, you're trained in healthcare or whether you're a nurse or medical or health practitioner. If, if we're walking down the street and, and we see someone stumble and fall and injure themselves, do we walk past and, and just say to ourselves, oh, gee, I hope they're okay. You don't see that every day, do you? Um, of course we don't. We stop, we reach out. Are you okay? Can I help you? Um, is there someone I can call for you? Um, we, we, we reach into the depths of our humanity, recognising that we have a moral drive within us to, um, to need to support our fellow humans. And, and I want to challenge you that I think, I think this exists here as well uh, in this area that we're talking about. As part of your reflections, um, start to think about what are the pebbles in your shoe? What are the pebbles in my shoe? What are those little things that go on at work that, that I'm, I'm, I'm managing, I'm dealing with, but they're a pebble in my shoe? You know the story of pebbles in shoes. They're, they're an irritant and, and sometimes nothing more. However, um, what, we, what we often do with pebbles, first of all, when we notice them in our shoes, is we try to scrunch our toes and, and, and get the pebble into that place kind of uh, be behind your toes and in, in, front of the, uh, in front of the ball of your foot because you don't feel it there, do you? Um, but if you keep walking, eventually it'll slip out and it'll end up under your toe or under the ball of your foot. And if you keep walking and keep walking, that pebble will eventually start wearing the skin. It'll eventually start blistering the skin. It will eventually cause an injury and pain. When it starts causing injury and pain while you're walking, what else do you start doing? you start limping, which means you're starting to put uneven stresses on the other leg now as you walk. So that little pebble in the shoe can ultimately turn into something that has a, a, a broad impact unless we take the time to recognise it and do something about it. So think about pebbles as they relate to those six areas, workload, autonomy, reward, uh, community, fairness and the values that you uh, that you have think about what will happen if we don't take the time to get these pebbles out of uh, the shoes and remember that small changes make a difference um, how long does it take to whip your shoe off and get a pebble out not very long but boy does it make a difference when you start walking again feel so much more comfortable it's worth taking the time to recognize those pebbles and to do something to get them out there are some things we can do individually too. I want to be careful about how I set this up though, because we've said that um, we've said that burnout is a workplace issue, and I've already um, confessed to uh, some professional embarrassment back in the 1990s of being part of a you know a profession that that tended to view burnout as something that was largely the responsibility of the individual. So I don't. I certainly don't want to uh, encourage that view. Uh, it, it, burnout comes from uh, workplaces, but it does have individual uh, impacts on us. And there are things that we can do to protect ourselves. The analogy I often use here is a um, is a safety belt. I, I can't I can't see you, but I want to ask you to reflect for a moment. Um, do you put a safety belt on when you get into your car? Do you do you put your seatbelt on when you get into your car? And you're probably saying to me, yeah, of course I do, every, every single time. And now I'm going to ask you, well, why? You're a good driver, aren't you? Don't you trust your own driving? And you're going to say to me, yeah, of course I trust my own driving. I don't trust the people around me. That's the problem. Same thing. Um, even though uh, burnout comes from factors around us, there are still things that we can do as individuals that will help us to, uh, to get through that better off than if we don't do those things. So the first is to have both a prevention and response mentality or mindset about this. Second is to remember the, uh, the important pillars of health and uh, well-being. Uh, and the third is to think about your identity, think about who you are. So let's start with, um, with prevention and response. Um, the analogy I, I love to use here is, is the old um, asthma analogy. So um, I, I'm sure um, you're all uh, very, very familiar with this. Um, people who uh, are managing their asthma well are often using two medications. Uh, one is a medication that they use on a regular basis. 
two, maybe three times a day even. Uh, and the purpose of that medication is to minimise the likelihood that they're even going to experience an attack of asthma. Uh, it, it, it just it reduces that likelihood right down. So it's really important to be doing that regularly. In addition, they carry another medication which can uh, reduce the severity of the signs and symptoms if they do have an asthma attack. Uh, and you probably know, again, from your uh, professional work that, um, that people who often have poorly managed asthma tend not to use or sometimes don't use that first medication that we talked about. They don't take the time to minimise the likelihood um, that they only react to the situation when it emerges. This is really important because taking, taking that time to minimise the likelihood is one of the best defences that we have, uh, that we all have uh, against burnout. Once you've done that, um, that doesn't guarantee that it won't occur. It, it, it does greatly reduce the likelihood and then it makes it easier to manage the symptoms if they emerge. What are, some, uh, what are some things that we can do about that? Well, um, I always come back to the six pillars of health and well-being. Uh, and these are the pillars of lifestyle medicine that have been shown time and again through really robust research to make a significant difference to our overall experience of living and thriving and loving life. Um, they are things that are entirely within our control. So they're like, they're like the seatbelt in the car. Um, regardless of how other people drive, you can always put your seatbelt on. Regardless of what's going on at work, you can always do these things. They don't guarantee that you won't encounter a challenge, but they do put you in a much better position to be able to deal with those challenges should they emerge. Um, the first is healthy eating, um, and uh, the, 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 the two things that Australians can do more than anything else to improve their diets are uh, put more vegetables on your plate and reduce the amount of processed food um, that, that we eat. Um, those two things alone would make a, a really significant difference. But, but do attend to your, uh, to your eating and your diet. Um, attend to physical activity and exercise. I'm sure you're familiar with the, uh, the exercise guidelines, 150 minutes, moderate intensity uh, per week. Pretty much chop it up whatever way you like. Uh, it doesn't, you can be 30 minutes, 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there, it really doesn't matter. The cumulative, uh, the cumulative amount is, is what matters here. Beyond the, um, beyond the exercise, though, of course, is just the, the idea of activity, being as active as you possibly can uh, for every, um, every moment that you are awake every day. Uh, and if you have a sedentary job, um, that may mean um, deliberately looking for ways to get up and move around and, and do something different. Um, finding ways to manage stress. Uh, things that you can do consistently um, that might be walking, it might be walking your dog, might be walking your dog in a particular location, might just be sitting with your dog, might be, might be stroking your dog fantastic stress uh, stress management technique might be meditation might be reading whatever it is um, and there are there are so many ways um, that we all have of doing this but find something that works for you um, remember that relationships are one of the best defenses that we have against um, against stress um, the, the world's longest running uh, study in health the Harvard health study which's been going since uh, the 1930s uh, has consistently shown the power of relationship to make a, a really substantial difference to our overall health and well-being. Um, sleep, uh, so important, um, seven to nine hours in bed, um, sleep hygiene, equally important, dark room, cool room, quiet room. Um, the cool is particularly important at this time of year. It's that time of year where we all tend to have heaters and air conditioning on. Uh, it, it can be easy to overheat your heating, uh, your sleeping environment. Um, so, uh, so just be careful of that. Um, allow your body to, uh, to cool through the night. Um, 
and uh, get devices out of bedrooms. They have no place there. Um, all, all, all the best speakers on sleep, um, all the best um, um, theoreticians on sleep say that there are two things only that should happen in a bedroom. They both start with S. The first one of them is sleep. So make sure that that represents, uh, that represents you. Tobacco cessation, of course, um, but I'm gonna add in there substance minimization. So being careful about those substances, particularly those two really common ones that we talked about earlier, uh, caffeine and alcohol. Um, there are others, analgesics um, and, and other substances that people might ingest as well. Um, caffeine and alcohol are the big ones. So, uh, so make sure that if you, if you do enjoy caffeine and, and alcohol, that um, you're the person controlling them, not them controlling you. Uh, so taking the time to do those things uh, is a bit like wearing uh, a seatbelt. Taking the time also to think about who you are. If I were to ask all of you right now, you know, tell me about you, uh, tell me about yourself. One of the first things that you would probably say is, um, oh, I'm a nurse or you know, I'm a dietitian or I'm a, and you would insert your professional title or perhaps the, the name of your training uh, or your professional designation. In. I would do the same. Someone uh, asked me to talk about myself. I'd say, well, I'm, I'm a psychologist. We, we tend to hang on to that and it's an important part of our identity. The challenge when we're starting to come face to face with burnout is that it, it threatens our identity. It threatens who we are. How, how do I keep hanging on to being a nurse when being a nurse feels so awful all the time? It makes me feel so tired. I feel so negative about it. I feel so unproductive about this. That, that's a real challenge to an identity. So one of the important things to remember there is to remember that you are much more than this. Yes, you are a nurse. Yes, you're a healthcare practitioner. Maybe you're a doctor or a dietitian or a physiotherapist or any one of those, uh, any one of those titles. But you are much, much more than that as well. You're much more than that title. You're much more than your role, your degree, your qualification. You're much more than the achievements you've made. You're, you're much more than, than your marital status or even your parental status. You're a much broader person than all of those. Take the time to think about all of those things. Uh, you, might have, you might have heard a little uh, hint about that um, when uh, Claire introduced me. Um, when I'm not doing this stuff, I love to talk about some other things being a film and TV extra, um, making coffee, gardening, being a self-taught cook. Um, they're, they're minor parts of my life, but they're parts that matter to me nonetheless. And I hang on to them and I see them as, as things that, that help, help me to define who I am. Yes, I'm a psychologist, but I'm, I'm not just that. Um, I, I can, I can, if I choose to, put that to one side and, and recognise these other things in me as well. So I really encourage you to, to have that dialogue with yourself. Who even am I? Um, who even am I right now? Uh, apart from those things that I do professionally, um, what else do I do? What else makes me up? Um, I, I want to touch on the, uh, the doctor's ABCD of burnout. Um, I, I certainly don't want you to conflate this with, uh, with the very important doctor's ABCD of, uh, of first aid. Um, but there are some steps that we can go through in a, a, a process that we can put into place that will help us to recognise it, respond to it and move forward from it. And I want to, um, I want to show that to you right now. First of all, um, identify the danger. And, and the danger here, of course, is what will happen if we don't address this? What will happen if, if this is allowed to, to keep going, if this, if this situation keeps on going on? Ah, review that situation. Take that time to pause. You've recognised what's going on now. Now step back, reflect on it. Where is this coming from? What are the factors that are leading up to this? Remember to practice those six pillars that we just talked about because they're your safety belt, they're your seat belt. These are the things that are in your immediate control. Um, some of those workplace factors, you don't necessarily have immediate control over, but these you do. When you've got those in place, act now to begin addressing those workplace um, mismatches, you know, whether it relates to workload or autonomy or recognition and appreciation or 
connection, uh, whatever it might be, take some time to start doing something about that right now. Doesn't mean you need to fix it immediately, but taking some steps towards addressing that is very important. Remember, burnout arises from um, unmanaged stressors. When we're making efforts to manage them, that alone often tends to mitigate the impact of burnout. You don't have to have you don't have to have um, removed the stressors altogether. And in fact, I'm going to suggest that you probably can't ever. But what you can do is work to uh, work to manage those. Build your own capacity. Um, for challenges. And we're going to look at that shortly. Um, checking frequently with your colleagues, of course, that's the C. Um, um, be, be, be that person that you would like other people to be to you. Uh, and then um, finally, develop tolerance for ambiguity, uncertainty. Um, which is really, as I said, the, the new resilience. Re resilience helps us survive, but, um, but developing tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty helps us to, to keep, keep moving forward and deal with things that we don't know about yet. Things that we don't know about yet. Resilience is great for dealing with things that we do know about, but learning to tolerate ambiguity and uncertainty gives us a lot of flexibility for being able to deal with things that we don't yet know about. So what can you do to do that? Well, first of all, don't see opportunity as, uh, and don't see uncertainty, I should say, as a danger. See it as an opportunity to grow. See it as an opportunity to learn something new that you don't yet know. Um, another, another strategy is to willingly take on a task without experience. Put your hand up to do something that you don't know how to do. That will throw you into uncertainty um, and um, that will allow you the opportunity to both experience that uncertainty and find your way through that task. The end result, of course, will be efficacy. I did that. I managed that. Um, the end result will be pride, a sense of achievement and accomplishment. Do something spontaneously, um, you know, just uh, jump in and, and, uh, and do, do. Oh, sorry, we're just running short on time. We're pretty much needing to wrap up now, if, if that's okay. Oh, sure. I'm j just, just, about, just about at the end oh, anyway. Great. So, uh, yeah, yeah, coming, coming onto the last slide. Yeah. Um, do, yeah, do, do something spontaneously. Um, postpone a decision um, that, that you might normally make quickly. Look for challenges. Um, put yourself in the middle of them. Change things up at, at home or in your workplace. And importantly, share that you don't know. Um, that, that can really help you to, uh, to learn to tolerate those things. They do feel uncomfortable, but that's the whole idea. Um, we want to feel uncomfortable. Um, and then finally, there's a... Um, there's a, a, a URL here. Um, where is it? It's not, oh, there it is. Uh, there it is. Um, a URL. Um, it, this is a burnout inventory which you can take. Um, and I encourage you, if you want to, to, to take it. But re please remember, it's not diagnostic. It's not going to say, yes, you do have burnout or no, you don't. Um, it, uh, it will give you an indication of what you might be dealing with. If you're concerned, talk to someone about it. Um, but by all means, uh, go right ahead and take that as free, free to take and, and uh, easy to get a hold of. Uh, and then finally, um, um, resource yourself for the challenges ahead. Black Dog Institute has some fantastic resources for health professionals and that, that's the link on that slide uh, just there. Um, you, you'll be able to, um, you, you can't click on these I don't think, but, uh, but you'll, be able to, uh, you'll be able to locate those and make use of those, um, make use of those resources for yourself. There we go. Thank you. Lovely. Um, Thank you um, so much, Simon. That was a really yeah, thanks, wonderful Beth. presentation and um, really wonderful opportunity to get some, um, I guess, prompting to reflect not only how we're feeling, but how our colleagues and others around us are. So thank you so yeah, much. Absolutely. And also for the great resources you've provided at the end as well.